And we're live. All right, welcome back to the Shop Class Podcast. We got we got hats. We got hats. And we got shirts. We got shirts with uh we got big shirts with stuff on the back and embroidered stuff. Come on, check that out. That one's good. That one's good. Right there. And we also have good time. We got Matt Bluecrest joining us as well. Tonight's guest is Joe Conapaki. He is a home inspector and a MG auditor, uh, and he's going to tell us more than just those two little titles. Uh, I'm sure there's much more to it. Joe, how you doing? Doing well, guys. How are you today? All right, and uh, we got a good round table going. Uh, you know, we got uh, Matt Bloomquist in the house. What's up? Hey, Joe. Nice and, to meet you. And we got Duke. What's going on? Okay. We got Nick. Present. Nick, Nick's there. I'm present. And still at school. He's still at school. It's late. <laughs> and uh, we got Rafi. There you go. How you doing? Great. Nick, I All hope right. you're at least working on your own project. No, I was here for a board meeting. I had to do sound. So. Nice. Oh, sound. <laughs> right. Uh, so this is the week before JLC, which is uh, a big uh, residential construction show. And uh, I, I know nothing about it, you know, and it's pretty amazing. Uh, I'm coming from such a, a different place. But as a shop teacher, it's great to learn and share all these different things. So if you're new to JLC, it's the uh, Journal of Residential Construction, right? Light Construction. Uh, light construction. What's that? Oh. Journal Sorry. of Light Construction. A light construction. Residential Construction. Got it. And um, so, you know, it's pretty cool. I'm going. I can't wait. I'll be there Friday, just one day. But Joe has been there before. And uh, he's going to tell us uh, a little bit about it. Maybe give me some pro tips. Uh, but more importantly, we're going to get into uh, energy audits and the red door of truth. Dun, dun, dun. I, this is my favorite thing. I love this thing. Um, basically, energy audits, you know, it's like your house is an envelope, which, you know, if you're like me, that doesn't mean anything. Uh, but you're, I'm learning. That's pretty cool. Uh, it's, you know, worrying about your energy. So let's start with the first question we ask every guest. Joe, did you have yes. shop class growing up? We did not have shop class at our high school. Um, although you can consider that my father homeschooled us in shop class and my, my, uh, my classmates were my, my brothers. So. I was homeschooled shop class. That's okay. I, I didn't have shop class either. And that's the irony of this whole situation is that I'm a shop teacher and, uh, you know, I'm always trying to connect with other shop teachers. Um, so, yeah, I just walked around junkyards in Hackensack, <laughs> you know. Uh, it was like, you know. Um, so that's okay. And what kind, of, what kind of stuff did you do at home? Your dad was a uh, – Contractor or or cabinet cabinet maker? Um, my dad was uh, you know immigrated after World War II, became a wood finisher, and was basically a wood finisher, a um, couple different outfits in Chicago. Um, but you know he was like he did you know the, the, the McDonald's and Water Tower place that got you know renovated in the, probably the early '80s, maybe like '70s, I forget. Um, but he was you know he was a peacock that he got to work on stuff there, and so uh, you know he had a really sharp eye, and when you're looking at you know, wood finishing, and um, I mean, you're looking at it at, at you know, really light angles to see if there's any bumps or you know uh, irregularities because it's going to show. Someone's going to be walking past it and they're going to see you know that break in the in the in the sheen or whatever. So um, so yeah, that that's the kind of critical eye I grew up with was the, the critical eye of a union wood finisher. So uh, I like to say that you know he was he of all the people I know, he was the best at finding faults. Um, and I, I, I had the same power, you know, like he bestowed that upon me as far as, you know, genetics and, and nurturing, uh, 
but I, I, I like to think that I use my powers for good instead of uh, frustrating my children. So, um, so we, we, you know, my, my day is, is noticing things and helping people understand, uh, you know, what, what they've got to deal with. So, um, and I've got, you know, I've got a pretty good background of residential construction and apartment management rehabs and remodels. And so I've, I've kind of been all up and down uh, uh, single family and multifamily residential construction management rehab and the whole, the whole mess. So, um, so, you're, so, oh, sorry. So you said mm -hmm. noticing things. You're a, uh, a, a home inspector, right? And uh, yes, you know, it's interesting. Yeah, so you've probably seen lots of different stuff. Do you want to give us um, you want to give us some examples of the extremes? Uh, um, you know, you, I mean, ex there's extreme issues that, like, you know, I have to, I'll drive down the road and I'll see stuff on people's houses. I don't even have to get out of the car half the time. Um, you know, especially you know. The, or frosty roof, you know, in the morning, you see areas of heat loss and, you know, from air leakage or poor insulation, that kind of stuff. So a lot of times those subtle little things that you catch. Um, I think with, with home inspectors, the, the real, um, you know, you give yourself kind of a blue ribbon when you can find the tricky things, you know, the things that were kind of covered up um, or maybe there were signs, but they were very subtle. Um, you know, I, I, I caught the fact that somebody had cut through ceiling joists in a house during doing a renovation. Um, and they, you know, they stapled them back together effectively, um, but not before the outside wall had splayed apart. And, and what caught my eye was part of the soffit material popped out. Like, why is the soffit material, you know, that's hanging horizontally, you know, why is that popped out? And then, you know, you sight down the wall, you're like, oh, wait a second, the wall's bowed out. And then you go, well, wait a second, what's holding the wall? You know, so you kind of follow, you just keep pulling the thread back and you're like, get up in the attic. You're like, there you go. I can see the cut. I can see that it spread two inches. They sistered this, they covered the insulation. You know, they finished the drywall cracks on the inside of the house. They put a for sale sign up, you know? Um, so it, it, it's that kind of, you know, recently renovated houses are, are you know, just they, they pucker up most home inspectors because, you know, you can't see behind the drywall. You know, and, and, and so now you're trying to judge what somebody did behind, you know, behind the drywall by what's showing outside the drywall, you know, and, and the argument is, if this looks, if this is this bad outside the drywall, how can I presume anything behind the drywall is any better? So, you know, a lot of times you're, you're trying to predict the iceberg by seeing little snow caps, you know, little snow cap problems. You're like, maybe there's an iceberg behind this thing. So um, it, it can be sometimes a, a challenge. Um, and, you know, people expect you to see everything and the future. So you, you do what you can to set expectations and then, uh, you know, and, and do a good job for people. And also, I understand you've done some coordination with, uh, with Matt Bloomquist on the Taylorville site. Is that right? No, that, that is to be determined. That's a work in progress. Not enough to talk about. Okay. Gotcha. Uh, Mark, Mark okay. Willie's our, our, our mutual it. connection. <laughs> Oh, okay, I got you. Um, now, we how early? What's that? I said we have plans to make plans. Oh, good. Okay. Um, now, how did you? Uh, now, uh, uh, let's just go around the room here. I'm sure. I'm sure Nicholas and 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 Tim and Duke and Raffi. Uh, did you guys have home inspectors come in, and was it helpful? And what did you guys find? <laughs> I'm sorry, but it was a joke. <laughs> like. Oh, the little, you know, that the inspector could look, it's like, I could see more than that, you know, just by poking my head in the attic, <laughs> you know, it was, you know, but we were young and naive and did what we were told and <laughs> check that box and it helped, but. <laughs> well, that's our. Yeah, my my issue was, was, was sad, uh, but I didn't know what to expect either. It was before I went, when I went through the training, I was like, man, that guy ripped me off. That was a shabby home I didn't know any better, you know. So, J Joe, can you make up for the bad home inspector that Nicholas had, please? <laughs> uh, yeah, we come and do. I'm not moving. Yeah, you know, what do you do except the next, the next right thing? 
right? I mean, you can't change the past, so you kind of go, okay, that, you know, let's learn the lesson, and what's the next right thing to do, you know? So maybe, maybe we do a performance test for them and, and show them where, where the opportunities for improvement lie. So that's, that's usually what we're doing after home inspections is, is, you know, they own the house and then they go, geez, things are starting to break, things are gonna have to get replaced. What do I do and in what order do I do it? You know, the furnace guy says furnace, the window guy says windows, insulation guy says insulation, surprisingly, you know, and you probably need them all, but which order? You know, oh. in, you know, what order and in what measure and in what location, you know? And so you count those, on those guys to, to diagnose everything accurately in a whole house fashion and line up in order. Thank you. That's an interesting angle because, right, because you're not trying to sell furnaces. So you don't have a, a bias towards any one particular thing. So you're like, okay, I'm just representing the homeowner and a good inspection. So that's interesting. Uh, Joe, I'll defend you. I, uh, not that you need it. Oh, there's, there's some shabby inspectors out there. Uh, I'm not even, yeah. I'm not even going to say there aren't. That's okay. I had a good one. Um, I almost bought a house. It was crazy. I almost bought this, like a old ambulance repair shack in Patterson. This was, I was young and dumb and I just wanted a garage and this was cheap. And it was somehow sectioned off from, uh, from the mansion and it, then they in the I don't know 50s they turned like some old mansion from 100 years ago and they turned it into an ambulance repair shack in the 50s or something like that and then somebody started living in it but by building a house above it and the inspector walked in and he's like this is not a house and I was like what's what's wrong it's just a big garage he's like oh dude and he like showed me he's like look and actually what he found in like two seconds was that the, the structure that was originally put up was not rated to hold a house above it and was already compromised. Termites had eaten most of the main pillars that went up. And so this thing was like, and all of the electric was not up the code. And he's like, and no one had arrived yet besides the inspector and I. He goes, I'm going to do you a favor. He's like, and I never tell people this. I'm gonna fail this and I'm gonna and and that's it. And I go, really? Wait, what's going on here? And he's like, you're gonna thank me later. <laughs> and, oh yeah. And it's I mean, this is a long time ago. But so he pulled the ripcord for you. Just you're out. Exact. He just was like, dude, no. <laughs> you're not buying this house. <laughs> a lot dude. of times, a lot of times. You're not even buying a house looking at the energy aspect of it. You're looking at how many bedrooms it has, how many bedroom bathrooms it has, and what it looks like from the outside. Like you're not really thinking about, you know, if there's gaps in the windows, gaps in the garage doors, how old the roof is, you know, and you're so excited when you're house hunting. You you really don't care what the energy problems are, you know. That's a good point. Like, it's not on most buyers' radar, man. It's it's location, uh, you know, room number, of rooms number, of parking spots, amenities, you know, and then and everybody has a presumption that it, it all works fine. Like it's all going to be perfect. New ones are going to be perfect. Old ones are going to be perfect. Like, man, you're buying you're buying somebody else's, you know, road hard and put away wet house. I mean, this is they they lived in it hard in some cases. Uh, it's not going to be perfect. So it's one a big part of the job is setting people's expectations. You know what you know what you know what do we do what can we show you what can't we tell you um i mean there's just stuff i can't see the future and crystal ball hasn't been looking for a while you know um but uh and, and you're not buying a perfect house and you can't and when, when somebody's selling a house they're not going to make it perfect for you you know you, you just you're just trying to oh you know buy the house with with eyes open that you know to, with with kind of full disclosure here's here's the dented up you know, old house that used house that you know you're getting. So it's uh, it it's sometimes interesting who whose fantasy bubble. You know, they got its bubble of fantasy around their head, and you got to pop that bubble pretty early on. Like, so if something's wrong, I could just you know call the old owner and have him fix it. I'm like, you know, you you are responsible, which means you can fix it or you can pay somebody to fix it. But it's not anybody else's fault. It's it's your responsibility. Mm. You know, so. 
there's sometimes you have to have discussions like that just so people understand that you know this if you don't want to handle it that's fine buy yourself a condo you know or, or so you know, get an apartment with people you know there's maintenance crews to take care of this stuff but if you can't handle it um you know not not everybody needs to buy a house you know it's a, I mean, there's, there's been times in my life where I was like, man, I wish I didn't have a house to, to, to take care of, you know? And that's, that's the that's good and the bad about living in Manhattan. Yeah. Oh, right. I live in Manhattan yeah. in an apartment and I am jealous always of backyards and gardens. And, you know, my kids are not digging in mud. Uh, they're older now, but, you know, and then I talked to my friend who lives in Maryland and he's like, yeah, I just had to put a new, you know, uh, driveway in and his heater broke. He had to replace that. And it's like every few months, he's like, he goes, I just paid a year's month, a, a year's rent in Manhattan on one thing on my house. <laughs> oh my God. That's wild. Yeah. So, so it's like, you know, this like juggle of like, it's great to not have to take care of a house and worry about all that stuff. But on the other hand, I think I would swap. You know, and Duke brings up a really good point with the energy situation. Um, I don't even think that, like, if you go to Zillow, do they have an energy score? Uh, is, um, this a, is this a thing, or they don't do any of this stuff yet? They're on different on on different MLS systems. So, me, I don't know about on Zillow. Um, there, there are, for instance, in Illinois, there on the MLS in Illinois, there's a there's a section called the Green MLS, and that's where you can say that it's an Energy Star house. It's, you know, net zero. It's got a HERS index of 15. It's, you know, you did a retro, you know, the Illinois Home Performance retrofit, and you got to silver or gold level. So there's they're they're giving you a a venue to kind of brag on the house a little bit to try to show that is not a comp to you know you know a similar house down the street your house is better you went in there and you improved the performance of the house and so you can represent that in the uh in those in that green the green mls portion um but i don't know if that's filters down to zillow or, or any of the other online listings um i just know that illinois incorporated that uh here a couple years ago it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I just don't think people are thinking enough about that type of thing. Um, this is it, this is a tough market for energy. You know, everybody. I mean, the housing market's tight, so people are just trying to grab something and they figure we'll just have to fix it up when we get it. Um, but you know, or or you're commissioning the build, but even that's tight. You know, um, materials are tight and every you know labor's tight. Um, but yeah. The, you know, we, we've been trying to convince, you know, our new home builders, you know, uh, more of them to go Energy Star, you know, to differentiate themselves in the market. And their answer was, I just have to finish a house. That's all I got to do to sell it. I just got to finish it. You know, if I can find the guys and I can get the materials and I finish it, I'm selling it. It doesn't have to be hers anything. It doesn't have to be, you know, Energy Star anything. It's, I just got to get it done. And uh, I, I don't even know what's to I argue with it, you know. I mean, there's builders that... You know, I've been committed to doing Energy Star uh, prior to you know the, the last two years. And they're and they're continuing to, to go with it, so they they're they're not going backwards. Um, but to try to get builders to to bump up, you know, to the next level of performance, you know, code code compliance is the backstop, right? And so there, it's it you know, and this pisses off builders. But I say my code is a D minus, man. I mean, you do the D minus, you get the you get the diploma, you passed. I go, but don't don't tell me like I build the code. And like, mm, that's D minus, man. You want, you know, you go to Energy Star, maybe you're a C plus, maybe you're a B. You know, if, if you're if, you know you're going beyond code, but if you're just doing code building, you know, now today's D minus is better than ten years ago, twenty years ago, but it's still the lowest quality house you can legally build. You know, to code. So. Um, and that presumes that does presume that the code officials uh, are on top of their game and they're actually enforcing it uh, properly. So, and I can tell you that is not a foregone conclusion. Wow, that's interesting. So, D minus is more like a a metaphor for minimum, hitting a minimum. Am I right? That's it. 
I agree. Oh, Peter, how you doing? Good. Thanks for joining. Good this evening. Hello. Yes. Uh, uh, code built home is the minimum legal allowed building you can construct, and anything else is better. Uh, build it tight and ventilate it right, and then you're better off. Put a blanket around it, like we were talking about before. Uh, insulate, isolate. Um, have it clad properly, and seal it tight with good ventilation. That's what needs to be expected. Uh, consumers need to know that. Uh, what, well, builders that claim to be good home builders, well, depends on what scale you're using. Yeah, I, I don't think that a lot of people. This is still kind of a subculture, uh, in a way, in from my perspective. But you know, it seems like, which is a good thing. That's what makes the world go round. You know, uh, I think. Joe is probably in business because people don't know. <laughs> so exactly why I'm yeah. in business is people don't know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, now uh, I do want to ask you your your background and how you got to this point, but let's save it for a little later. I think we're kind of on a thread here. Sure. Um, and uh, uh, now as far as the energy ratings and codes that you guys have been throwing out there, I am really like I'm just new to this whole thing. So wh now, what do you what What's like a like when someone says, "Hey, it's built to code number four, Like, what what is that? Where and where do I find that? Uh, the generally years, you know, uh, International Residential Code (IRC), and then you have the uh, IECC, International Energy Conservation Code. Um, and so, different municipalities or states have accepted different years, right? So if you if you see like the most recent year is gonna be the, at least for the energy code, is gonna be the highest performing code. Um, so some, some states, municipalities will adopt the, the international code every time it changes. Sometimes they'll do every other change because it's, you know, whatever, it's a little tough to get everybody uh, um, on the same page, you know, or get it, you know, changing the code every three years. Um, you know, get all your builders to, to shift their practices. I mean, it's not like they're building a completely different thing, but, you know, eventually you're, you're changing your system of home, home building every three years. Um, slight changes here or there. Uh, so a lot of times it's every, every, every six years, you know, so they, they, they don't do every, every three year code change. So it, it varies. Um, so the, yeah. I guess the, the best way to, to know is to you know look uh, you know um, online and see what municipal you know what codes uh, your municipality is and are enforcing for new construction. So I'm in North Jersey. So how would I find what codes are being enforced? Uh, I would I would probably search Google New Jersey you know building code or you know building code for your county or building whatever code. your your uh, municipal code enforcement office is. Uh, whether it's a city or a county, um, they'll let you know. You go to their their code office. Code, code oh, now code okay. Enforcement. So I'm I'm, in, I'm naive about this. This is not independent. This is like a government. The government sets this. Is that right? State, county, municipal. It could be any. It, you know, in Illinois, it's the state. The state adopted the energy code, and the municipalities that have code offices, enforcement offices, are obligated to enforce that. The state adoption. Um, sometimes they do a good job enforcing it. Sometimes they don't even make an attempt. Um, but you know, they they are the authority having jurisdiction. And if their authority says we're going to ignore it, well, then I guess they get to ignore it. But I get to still tell my client that uh, hey, your municipal code inspector is allowing the builder to ignore a state requirement. Um, I wouldn't be okay with that. I yeah. would, I would, I would insist that the mechanical ventilation be installed in my house because he made the thing as tight as a plastic bag with the spray foam that he's proud as a peacock about, but yet he didn't put a mechanical ventilation system in my house. So we're living in a very quickly stinky plastic bag. Got it. Yeah. You have that air. I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm coming at it from, you know, like just a shop teacher perspective. And, you know, I'm just thinking somebody listening to this might be a shop teacher and maybe 
they're like me where it's interesting, but they don't know where to start. And so, you know, I guess for instance, like we have a shop teacher building a, a, a miniature house in, uh, in, inside the shop. Um, not everybody gets to build a house outside, you know, bloom quest is building like a full size house. Um, but so we're building this mini house and then it would be cool to like try and get it up to code. And then the way to get it up to code would be, um, is that through visual inspection or is that through using an energy audit? There are um, diagnostic tests that are in, in, the, in the more recent codes. You have to do a building leakage test on it. Forward or building envelope tightness, uh, building leakage. I mean, it all, all, it's all talking about the same thing. Blow door test, you're, you're, you're pulling pressure on the house and seeing how leaky it is. Um, every every new construction home in Illinois is supposed to be having that done. Constru uh, commercial buildings. We have. Uh, I just had a client call so that. Yeah, I have to. I, we have to figure out how to move eighty five thousand cubic feet per minute out of this place. So um, I got a colleague out of out of Madison that's got a fan that will move sixty five thousand cfm. So it, it pulls Whoa. up to an overhead door. And you got to plywood around the thing. And uh, and and if you walk too close to it, it will pull you up against the intake screen. It's oh my god! Yeah. All right. Um, now most most yeah. homes, it's just a big. It looks like a big box fan, you know, like a whole house fan in the ceiling or something like that. It's like a two and a half foot diameter fan, two foot diameter fan. Um, but that is required on all houses. If there's duct work going outside the, you know, into the insulation or out past the insulation. You've got to do a tightness test on the ducts. Uh, those are the those are the diagnostic tests that are required. Um, everything else is visual. I mean, even the mechanical ventilation. You know, that's that's part of the biggest area where, where things get skipped by um, by code enforcement is they'll they'll identify that a piece of equipment exists. But I I've come home eleven months in. You know, they they didn't have a an inspection because the house was new. You know, who needs to inspect a new house? It's perfect, right? Um, and so, you know, after living there for 11 months, they're like, uh, one year warranty is coming up pretty fast. I'm going to have somebody come in and inspect it before my one year warranty is up. And, you know, yeah, they had a ventilation, a mechanical ventilation system, and the wires are still coiled up and tucked inside the cabinet and not being hooked up to anything. 11 months later, you know, so somebody checked it off. Yep, it exists. It's there. Nobody ever hooked it. And, you know, and hooking it up is, is only part of the part of the challenge. You know, you got to measure it. You got to commission it. You got to make sure that it's actually moving the air that, that the house needs. Um, you know, you're trying to Goldilocks the thing. You know, not too much, not too little. You know, they didn't even hook it up. So, you know, Amazing. and it's and I'm not. You know, we're not trying to give people griefs. People have bad days. Somebody gets you know whatever call. You, you know, you got to go pick up your kid from school today. So he walks away without finishing the job, but then nobody picks up the slack and nobody you know quality control is not there and you know and then the homeowner doesn't think that that you know a, a new house needs to be inspected because it's perfect um you know so 11 months later i i came across a bath fan 17 years later and it still had the packing tape inside the thing so it was blowing against a closed damper because it was still taped shut from from sh initial shipping wow i found three i found three of those in the hvac contractor's house his guys put it together and of his eight bath fans, three of them are still taped shut on the inside. You know, so little things like that. You know, is this your employees working on the boss's house? What what's what's what do the rank and file clients get? Yeah, you know? wow. And the code the code enforcement guys didn't catch it. You know, um, so there's. I mean, if you do, if you don't if you don't test it, you're just guessing. You know, um, and too many people are just assembling boxes and kind of. I'm out. So um, you know, without, without having you know sharp set of eyes, you know you can be going, you can be putting a lot of systems together, whether it's framing or ductwork or whatever. Um, if nobody's double checking it, you know, I don't know, I don't know a plumber that packs up his tools without pressure testing the pipes, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I saw a plumber throw a wrench at his assistant because he started taking tools out of the job site. And he's like, "What are you doing? We're still pressure testing." We're not done until there's no leaks, you know? And like, that needs to be the mindset, you know, why is somebody else gonna find the problems? 
you're not done until you've tested what you what you put together right is find your own mistakes and fix them before anybody notices and you will have the perception of perfection you know yeah. um but no i make mistakes all the time but i catch them before anybody else does because yeah. why would i let anybody else catch my mistakes i'm not perfect i'm going to double check my stuff and so that's you know what i try to let builders and, and contractors off the hook man i'm not here to you know to give anybody brief i'm just here to make sure that houses get put together better <laughs> It's cheaper to catch the mistakes before the job is departed than it is to make a callback because that's just lost time and wasted travel. Now, oh, how, how early? Oh, go ahead. No, how says, early? Makes money on callbacks. Oh, true. How early in the process uh, should the inspector be involved? Actually, the inspector can be the job site's best, the owner's best friend. If you consult with the inspector, find out what they're expecting to see, uh, everything complete and correctly assembled, then the inspector knows, oh, you invited me here. Great. Let's talk. And you'll have an easier time with the inspections. And uh, passing the each inspection will be made easier as opposed to trying to duck and hide and evade the inspector. Uh, and, and then they'll come down hard on the job and they'll look for every little thing. Go ahead. Well, and, there, yeah. and there's a difference. I mean, you, you got code compliance, right? And so that's that in the municipal inspectors, right? Those you don't get around. I mean, those, those guys are they're going out their checklist. Um, but it's, there's still value in having somebody looking at it looking at it from kind of a whole house perspective because you can have a plumbing inspector look at the plumbing you have a framing inspector looking at the structural integrity of framing um you know the the air sealing and insulating parts are i mean air sealing is, is it's the reason it's been the toughest thing to incorporate is because air is difficult to see and yeah you know how, how you know how do you know if something's airtight you have to you have to do specialty testing you got to put on you know you got to look at it with infrared glasses your, your infrared camera you know you have to use smoke you have to visualize that airflow somehow so it's not surprising that people have you know not valued you know the, the or not you know have uh, valued air tightness accordingly um i felt stupid when i was going through my bbi classes i mean just like because it's like right there in front of your face you know and you're like i've I've not been paying attention to this. And now that I pay attention to airflow within a house, so many other things fall into line and, and you know, I, I can find explanations for the weirdest things. Um, but it wasn't until, you know, I fully appreciated, you know, air, the dynamics of airflow in a house, um, you know, before, you know, again, truly you, you go through class and you're just like, I can't believe all this stuff that I could have done better. Like, did I screw it up? Maybe, kind of. Did I know any better? No. I honestly, there's some, they, you know, I tell homeowners, like, sometimes they just don't know any better. You know, I'm not trying to screw you over. They just didn't know any better. Um, yeah. But at some point, that's got to change. You, you can only run that excuse for so long. Fine. Okay, that I'll give you a pass on that one. But since we're having this conversation, you don't get to pass on the next one. Because now you know. So now you're obligated to do better because you know better. Um, and that's, but you got to do that contractor at a time, trade, you know, technician at a time. So that's, uh, that's why podcasts like this are, you know, are, are valuable because, you know, now all of a sudden we got a multiplier effect as far as people going, air tightness, huh? I wonder what that's about. I should look into that. I mean, yeah, honestly, that, that's, it was going to a JLC uh, conference in, uh, in Minnesota um, back in like 2008. And uh, it was an individual, Mike Gorman, and he's, you know, he said, you know, improving your home, your remodeling business by incorporating home performance or something like that. I couldn't remember the, the title exactly, but I was like, home performance, remodeling. I'm like, huh, let's go check that out. And it was, you know, in an hour and a half, he, he you know, kind of alerted me to dynamics I hadn't, I hadn't considered, that, and I was answering questions you know you know you see something weird you're like i don't have an explanation let me put that on the shelf i'll figure it out at some point right and i was pulling those things off the shelf under like that's why this was happening and that's why that was happening 
and uh, I need to learn more about this because I've already, without this guy even teaching a class, just saying, hey, consider this, I was already able to answer, you know, things that I come across years ago that I had no explanation for. It was just a, a you know puzzle you put on the shelf and you're like, I guess I'll, I'll pick at it later. I'll figure it out at some point. Maybe someday I'll have an answer. And, and I got the answer that, you know, that day. And, and that pretty much started my path down, you know, the, the, the road of building science and, and being able to um, understand buildings uh, so that you can, again, fix up the ones that are there, build better the ones that you're starting. That's cool. So now let's go to, you know, how did you, uh, how did you get into, uh, how did you get into where you are now and, you know, take us down um, that journey. My family had, uh, apartment buildings. So we lived in a three flat, you know, so they're all piled into one, rented out the other ones. My dad, my dad bought another rental property and we fixed everything. I mean, my dad, he would fix anything. I mean, we'd spend, Time wasn't wasn't the issue. It's like if you could fix it for three dollars, you won. It didn't matter. It took you know seven hours to do it. And you could have paid somebody you know like a fraction of what the time it took you. The measure wasn't time. The measure was money and resource. You know, I mean, it's from you know from from actually Ukraine, Poland. You know, back in World War II. So everything was resource tight, money tight. Um, now I look at that, I'm like, it, you know, it set me up well because, you know, we, his, his mentality was you can fix anything that's broken. You know, educate yourself and get the right tools and you can fix anything that's broken. You can build anything you want to build if you have the right education and the right tools, right? And unfortunately, we all have the mental capacity to, to really realize that, right? I mean, you know, there's some people that are not firing all cylinders and there's, they're just not going to hit that level. Fortunately, you know, we, we came from good genetic stock and we were able to kind of really realize that. Um, but at some point you realize just because I can fix and repair anything doesn't mean that's the best use of my time. So at some point you have to kind of go, there's, there's some value in specializing. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I don't try to fix my car anymore. You know, I, I got, I know a good guy. He's really good at fixing cars. I'm really good at figuring out buildings, uh, you know. I know a guy who I know a guy who's really good at working on teeth, and you know, <laughs> I just as soon have him just focus on that, and uh, and you know, Ed will take care of his car, I'll take care of his house, you know, Mark will take care of your teeth. Nice. So um, that's a good so base. It, you know, that's a good base to start from. That's yeah, pretty good. Find find people that are that are good at what they do and and make friends with them, you know, um, or or hire, just play up, hire them to to do their job for you. You know, um, the biggest compliment to us is inspecting a seller's house for the buyer, right? So you're, by all arguments, you're poking holes in, you're finding issues with this person's house, right? So it's kind of a little tenuous little dance there as far as personalities and you're criticizing the place that they're living in and selling. Uh, maybe they're there for decades so now there's emotional value. So I have to, I have to critique this house for the benefit of the buyer. And when I can do so in such a way that the seller says, hey, can you inspect the house we're buying? Absolutely. Like that right yes. there is, is, that's a win right there, man. That's, you know, that's the gold, gold star for the day. When, when you can do a good job and not offend anybody and Im impress them to the point where they go, I, I want you to be a higher gun for me. And you were like, you're going to that buyer, but I'm the next buyer and I, I need you on my side. So that's, that's, that's the goal. And then, you know, sort of nice. Um, now, uh, let's switch it over to Matt for a second. Um, Matt, did you, uh, did you have an energy audit on the last house that you guys did at the high, with the high school students? No, we, we didn't. Um, not an official thing. So what we've been doing is uh, we we have we own a blower door kit, which you guys on here know that, um, and so we run our own because I don't even know any energy auditors around here. I know our house, Liam, you got to quiet, buddy. Um, I know we had it done because um, the utility, the power company had like a 
thing going on if uh they'd come and do an energy audit on your house and then they would you know provide uh you know insulate extra insulation and in fact we ended up getting a free upgrade at liam quiet buddy <laughs> uh we ended up getting a free heater he our furnace and ac installed because they had this big grant thing going on and I think it was, I think the only reason we qualified was just because not enough people asked and had it done. So we're like, oh, awesome. We were saving up for this and we got it. So, and they come in, they tighten up some things. Now, when they did all this, I was just getting introduced to this side of the building, you know, on the building side side. So I wasn't very familiar. If they would have spit numbers out at me, I wouldn't have had a clue. I knew what a blower door was. I knew they were air sealing. I got all that, but I wouldn't have known any better. They could have told me the numbers. I'd been like, all right cool yeah exactly right over the head so uh now as far as the house goes that we build with students i guess we do our own unofficial one um we this is one thing where mark and uh joe and i have kind of chit chatted on emails uh, one or two times about the idea of having joe come down and you know educate the students with it and you know kind of do a i mean i guess you could say it's an official energy audit i suppose since it would be joe doing it uh so that, that that's kind of what direction we're kind of going with connecting with professionals like Joe, uh, just because we don't really have a lot of those resources in rural Illinois, um, which I'm sure if I looked hard enough, I could probably find some. But uh, um, yeah, we're you know, you know work through our network friends here kind of thing. So right now we use the blower door as a building tool during the build. Oh, sorry. How far apart are you guys? Just hours or a couple hours? What time? What time are you in, Matt? Taylorville. Uh, I'm in Taylorville. We're just south of Spring, Springfield. So we're probably, depending on where you're in Chicago, West Suburbs. So maybe three, three and a half hours, unless you're really far north. Yeah. You probably wouldn't even be four hours away. Yeah, yeah it's probably closer to three. I'm in Southwest. So, um, yeah. No, we could. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's interesting to, to quantify you know, the, the level of performance of a house. And that's effectively what energy audit is, is you're just saying, okay, if this box, if I keep this box at 70 degrees all year long, you know, what's it gonna, what's it gonna eat, you know, for heat energy, what's it gonna eat for cooling energy? And then, you know, and then it, the next level would be to incorporate like, you know, plug loads and, and other appliances and that kind of thing. So that's where your energy star consumer appliances can factor in there, your lighting, um, you know, it's funny we, in energy auditor classes we teach we talk about you know base load being you know electric being usually your fridge and freezer that never turn off right they're always plugged in and they turn out on their own schedule to keep themselves cold um i think we have to factor in the freaking entertainment center the routers the computers the freaking xbox that never gets turned off you're lucky if they can turn the screen off you know when they go to school and they flip the screen on the game's still going they just paused it for for nine hours um, you know, so the base load electric is, is really kind of getting, getting up there. The only good thing is that with LED lighting and a lot of other, um, uh, you know, smaller electronics, they're, the, the loads are getting smaller, right? They're not, they're not they, you don't have that much of a lighting draw. The electronics are getting more energy efficient, throwing off less heat. So in general, components are getting more efficient, but there's a lot more stuff getting plugged in and left, being left on. Yeah, for sure. Um, let me, let me just ask, this might be a, oh, go ahead, Matt. Oh, sorry, my internet's being glitchy. So if I'm like a split second behind you guys, I apologize. No, you're good. Um, you're good. yeah, go that, that's kind of a good point too, Joe, because, okay. Um, so all our lighting in the house, fan, ceiling fan, really everything in the ceiling is all going to be run off a of low voltage. So we're literally running the entire lighting system off the house off of one breaker so we wow you know we'd have that we get we're gonna have obviously we build, we build more energy efficient as far as air sealing and things like that and insulation and better windows and uh and then for our air exchange we got zender uh is putting their system in um for us uh and then we'll have carrier doing heating and cooling and stuff so uh, yeah, it'll be, yeah, it'll be interesting kind of see if, you know, we do kind of like a full energy audit. Now, 
at the same time, we're, we're doing things before anybody lives in it. So, you know, the, we don't have any numbers to base it off of, of what somebody, I mean, I'm sure Joe could probably do a comparison of, you know, what it should do, but we're not pulling it off the numbers when somebody has lived in their house for 10 years and has historical records and then do like a upgrade that an energy efficiency upgrade then compare it to uh, where we're starting off brand new. But uh, yeah, it'd be interesting to see how this all comes out. And like I said, could be a cool learning experience for the kids. And definitely for me, I'm, I'm interested in all, seeing all of it come together. Yeah. Like I said, for us, the blower door is just a tool at the moment. Um, it, you know, does it it's a great tool for hot and down leaks? It's a great tool. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's like I said, air is, air is tough to see. So unless you're using some tools to figure it out, um, you know, it's tough to, to determine how good of a job you can, you know, you were doing. So, uh, no, it's, it's, I, I honestly, like if I was doing, if I was back in the rehab remodel days, I, I, I want to think that I would get one because, um, so many callback issues that remodelers have to deal with are air leakage related. Um, and they don't even realize it, you know, uh, they end up kind of chasing their tails and spending a lot of money on callbacks. And I'm like, you know, if you, if you could see, you know, identify those areas that, you know, that you can, you know, air seal and address and take care of that as, you know, the first time around night, now there's not even a problem to begin with, you know? Um, so it's, it's a cool set of tools. Hey, I just want to say, um, I, uh, I'm the remote I, and my battery is going on my computer. So I'm just going to stay when it drops out. That means my battery died. And, uh, oh. uh, I might have another 10 minutes or so. We'll see. Oh, okay. Then I just want to give you a heads up. If I drop out, I'm probably not getting back on. No, so. no problem. No problem. Let's do uh let's do a rapid fire then. Um, what, what's the, what's the difference between like an energy audit and like an, 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 an inspection and can, are those the same and how come they don't go hand in hand? It seems like those are separate. Um, yeah, because a home inspection is, is you know, a, a, a cursory glance effectively of all components in the house. So you're looking at I mean, a couple hundred different things when you go to a house. I mean, roofing, exterior, garage, uh, interiors, structure, appliances, electrical, plumbing, heating, air conditioning, ventilation, insulation, you know, yeah. And you got to do all that in two or three hours. Right. So you're looking at a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and it, it's like the nurse going through the checklist and that, you know, basically saying, Hey, doc needs to look at this a little extra. So when you need the specialist needs to look at that, I mean, you're looking at a lot, and you know, so it, it's wide, but not very deep. Right. And it's just, you know, you're giving somebody a better idea of the house that they're getting. Now, obviously, the deeper you can look in that period of time, the better inspector you're going to be. But a lot of home inspectors are fairly superficial and quick. Um, and if you're paying 200 bucks for an inspection, that's probably. Oh, did we lose him? <laughs> oh, there he's still here. Um, okay. I, th I think we are losing him. I'm not sure. Is he frozen now? Yeah, we lost him. Ah, oh, that's too bad. That was a quick 10 minutes. Yeah. All right. No problem. Um, uh, so, you know, the thing, the other thing I was going to get into was the fridge. Oh, here he's might be back. I'm not sure. Um, there's two of them now. <laughs> anyway, um, it's funny that you guys mentioned the fridge because, oh, there he is. Joe's back. All right. Oh, unmute yourself. You're muted. Step by step. All right, so we're on the phone. So you got to have a backup, right? There you go. Excellent. I should have had a backup charger, but backup phone will work. Don't even so, worry. Um, sorry, you were you were saying something. Oh no, that's okay. I was going to jump over to. I had a question about fridges, but um, you were talking about energy audits being separate from. Okay. Yeah. So, so so the home inspection again. You're looking at a lot of stuff. You don't have a whole lot of time to get very deep. You're identifying that something is wrong with a particular system. You don't have time to do a full deep dive to it, right? I'm not an HVAC tech, I'm not doing a full diagnostic. I just identified that the temp rise is too high or it's shutting off on high limit or, you know, something's wrong. You know, it, it, I don't know exactly what, but you know, it's not working properly. Um, 
uh, an energy audit can mean a lot of different things. For most, most times it, you're evaluating an existing home. So you're taking in all the, you know, the components of the house and then doing a calculation of heat loss, heat gain, energy usage. Um, and you can do that quantitative analysis on a new construction home. You can do it off of plans, right? I'm doing an energy audit of a proposed new construction home and put a, you know, put a, a quantity of BTUs or kilowatt hours uh, that might be used or in, you know, a HERS index or some type of score to, to compare it among other houses. Um, when we do existing homes, so this is a homeowner that's got cold rooms or hot rooms or icicles and ice dams or moisture issues, or there's something, their home is not performing the way they'd like it to. So um, that's why I call it a performance test. It's qualitative. Where is it bad? How do we make it better? Um, and um, it's hard to justify doing a quantitative analysis on an existing home because you just don't have the detailed information you would need to do an accurate calculation. I mean, if you're okay with pretty wide error bars, then, you know, maybe you can do something and you go, yeah, it's going to be plus or minus 20%, plus or minus like, you know, and, and in my experience, existing homeowners don't care about the number of BTUs being lost through the windows or the walls or the doors. They want to know why is that floor cold and what should we do to fix it? Right. So home performance test, um, less quantitative, more qualitative, more useful for, for, you know, a homeowner that's just looking to resolve issues, you know, in a, in a comprehensive manner, right? Or with some comprehensive consideration. Um, I don't want to just fix that thing. I don't want that symptom to go away. I want that problem to be resolved, right? I can clean mold away every year, or I can fix the problem that is causing the mold to return every year, right? right? So the mold cleanup guys don't tell you why the mold keeps forming. They just come and clean it up, right? Um, like, like taking I, an Advil instead of finding out why you have the headache in the first place. You're not drinking enough water, something like you that. You know what? Air, air quality issues in home. People are, blame a lot of stuff on a lot of things, and we find a lot of them related to air quality concerns. You know, not, not removing uh, exhaust from their oven stoves or fireplaces properly. Um, keeping the house closed up too much and you're breathing your own carbon dioxide, you know, that'll, that'll make you lethargic. It'll make you muddle headed. Um, you're just going to feel poor because, you know, your the carbon dioxide levels in your blood are, are, are rising because you're in a cloud of your own exhalation. Um, and you don't have to be in a super tight house for that to happen. You could just spend a lot of time in a room with the door closed, huh. you know, um, and, uh, you know, so a lot of those aspects fall, you know, there's comfort, there's air quality, there's moisture management. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of reasons why, you know, people will have us come in and do a home performance evaluation. Um, and I would say that that's probably the next, next level of investigation beyond a home inspection. But when you're doing a home, the, 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 the transfer of title of a house, a home inspection, in whatever state you're in is going to have some standard of practice. And that's the level that you're doing that investigation. People can hire us to do a deeper investigation, but in some cases you're like, um, it's hard to distinguish between a deficiency and an opportunity for improvement. Every house has opportunities for improvement, but buyers hear that as, Oh, those are deficiencies that I'm gonna to have to pay for later. I want them. I want them fixed up by the, by the seller now. I want the seller to reinsulate my attic. It's not your attic yet, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, and they lived yeah. with that house for twenty years like that. Why are they going to drop five grand to insulate your attic on the way out the door? You know, it's you're buying a used house. You know, so that again, that's we get back to setting expectations for people. Every used house has opportunities for improvement. That doesn't make it deficient, you know, in, in a home home inspector perspective. So the reason those aren't done together, it's because it's, it's hard for buyers to, to kind of make that's to make that separation. 
Um, Interesting. That, I really appreciate <laughs> you explaining that because to me, I was always like, why are these things separate? But you're right. It's uh, you're just trying to hit sort of a minimum. Uh, you know, you're transferring the title, and yeah, there's a lot of things at stake, like the selling of the house. So someone says, "Oh yeah, I want you to hit this energy score." They're like, "I hit her." That would be like, "Oh, there's a I got an old car. You're gonna buy the car," and then the independent mechanic says, "Hey, you got to make this thing have more horsepower." I'm not adding more horsepower to the car. You, this is it. <laughs> higher, higher MPG, man. I need, I need two more miles per gallon, and then or not buying it. Right. You're buying a used car, man. It is. <laughs> if you don't want to buy it, you don't have to. But you know, you can't. You, you should not expect that somebody is going to improve upon it before handing it over to you. That's awesome. It's very true. I. This is. Thank you. I appreciate that. Makes a lot of sense. Um, and so the um. Actually, let me get over to Bloomcrest real, real quick. Uh, he put something in the chat. Go ahead, Bloomcrest. You want to talk about that? Oh, he's got a glitchy internet. Okay. Um, he said he wants to do a remodel with students uh, so that he could find, you know, show the proper way to make that improvements are done. You know, and I guess if you got a house instead of they build a house from scratch, but if they yeah, got a house, I was, uh, you know, just talking. Go for it. We'll wait for him. He's doing. He's he's got a glitchy internet. Go ahead, Matt. Okay. All right. Um. My yeah, his internet's through? glitching out. But so, but it's interesting. You're glitching. My you're kind of like on. Sometimes. Glitchy. You um, keep your video off and just do the audio. Oh yeah. Audio. Okay. If it's too glitchy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so what's interesting about the whole thing? Yes. Is that I can hear you now. <laughs> this is funny. Okay. okay. Can you hear me right this now? This internet's too glitchy tonight. Yeah, but it's coming Go in. Massive. So, so the interesting thing about it, yeah, the interesting thing about it is um, it seems like the energy audit doesn't get its fair shake because, you know, we live in these houses for, you know, you're inside the house for a long period, at least when you're sleeping. And then you're there for all the holidays and all the times you're sitting on the couch and all the times you're doing stuff in the house, or whatever, you're in the house a lot. You know, and then um, you're paying the bill. And so it's funny that it's just not getting like the, you know, it's due because it seems like it's worth it for somebody to do an energy audit. What, what are your thoughts on that? Am I, am I off base? Do you think it's not worth it or what? Should everybody get an energy audit is basically my question. Um. I think everybody should have some type of performance uh, assessment of the house, whether it needs to be a quantitative audit. I, I, I see there's a lot of gray area in there. Um, some people don't need that level of, of detail. I mean, when, when I got into this, you know, I got BPI certified, I got ResNet certified all within half a year or so, nine months of each other. And so you know, I was on the quanti I have to quantify all this page. And in talking with homeowners, I very quickly realized one, they don't have a grasp of the numbers and they're not impressed by you using five dollar words to explain it to them. Um, they they either check out or they kind of feel um, like like you're trying to put on airs. Oh, look at you so smart using your big words, right? You know, the whole thing with, with getting people to improve their house, to improve the performance of their home is um, they, they have to buy into it. They've got to, they've got to, you know, put their money, you know, behind making a change. Um, and so that means they got to want to do it. And when people call me, it's, they're not calling to, because they want to save energy. They, they're calling because 
they have a cold room or a hot room or moisture issues or icicles or icing, they have a home performance problem. So, you know, we go in there and help them understand what the source of the problem is so they can fix that. And then, and then, and then that's a win, right? So they go, great. I resolve. I never have to deal with my icicles ever again. Like that's a, that's a huge win. Right. And, and in the process of that, you go, Oh, by the way, cold floor in Timmy's room, here's what's causing that. You know, the moisture in that closet, here's what's causing that. And they go, Oh, well, let's add that to the to-do list. And now you're baby stepping them in the, in the direction of improving control and overall performance of the house. Um, and at some point, maybe they want to do, you know, a, a, a deep retrofit of the house. Um, you know, maybe they're, maybe they're selling the house and they want to list it with a HERS index, you know, uh, to, to try to stand out, you know, among the other, among the other homes. Um, but I think just some level of, of diagnostic home performance evaluation um, would benefit every homeowner, you know, say a year or two into their home ownership. You know, you've, you've experienced a couple winters, you've experienced a couple summers, you know, um, you start rubbing against the, you know, the tight spots in the house and you're trying to like, you know, if I can make some changes, here's what it would be. And the furnace is getting old. And so you start to get, you know, they, they get all these ideas about what about the house needs to get tweaked you know, or, or just fixed completely. Um, and, and, and then we come in to say, okay, here's the next level of investigation. Here's why your house is doing what it's doing. Um, they fix those issues and they, then they feel the result. They see it in their, you know, in your dropped utility bill, but that's cherry on top. Like nobody's calling me saying, Joe, you need to help me reduce my, my gas bill. It's cold room, hot room, it's performance, it's comfort, it's moisture management, it's air quality. Those are the things they're talking about. And, and we, the energy efficiency gets brought along for the ride. Here's how we're going to improve the performance. It's by bumping up your energy efficiency. We're not, we're not trying to make, you know, we're, we're, we're dealing with energy efficiency as much as we need to, to resolve the performance issues that have been bugging you. Wow, it's interesting. Well put. You know, it's interesting. you're kind of like a teacher in a way. You have to make sure you check on your audience, who you're dealing with, you know, I guess if you're dealing with customers. Yeah, I, got, I, I didn't realize that, but of, of course, that makes sense now. They're not calling you to be like, yeah, I can't wait to like outperform the guy on TV or something like that. They're just like, yeah, that wall's cold and my feet are cold in this spot when I walk around the kitchen. Hey, what can we These do windows are that? drafty. Yeah, exactly. Interesting. That is interesting. Hey, let's let's talk about fridges for a second. This, this might be off topic. I just my own curiosity. You know, um, it's funny that the fridge is a box, and you heat the room to cool the box. Why don't? Why isn't the heat? If it's winter time, how come that's not vented outside? And why don't they use some of the cold from outside to set it up in the fridge? Have, any, have you ever thought about this at all, or is this kind of way off topic? It's all, it's all about control. I mean, you're trying what's the easiest way to control the temperature in that box, make it airtight and make it insulated, right? What happens when you leave the fridge door cracked open a hair? Yeah, that's it. Now you got, now you got condensation issues. You got mold growing around the door because the cold air is spilling out. You got ice building up on the coils. That's, I mean, sometimes you look at a house and you go like a house in the summertime is a fridge. It's not as cold as a fridge, but, you know, it's, it's an airtight box, or at least you hope it is, that's insulated, or you hope it is, and you're sucking the, the air conditioner is absorbing the heat from inside your house and, and kicking it to the outside. It's your, your house in the summertime is a fridge. It's just not nearly as high performing as a fridge. Um, so in, in some ways, a fridge is a, is a good analogy of what we try to do to the house. Now, um, for those of us that have been in the food industry, there's our, you know, there are restaurant industry. There are basically portable ovens that look like a rolling cabinet and they call them Alto shams, or at least that's one of the companies. And all it is, is an insulated box that's airtight with a bunch of wire shelves and a heat coil in there. And you plug it into a 220 plug and it's a, you know, Hey, I need to, you know, you're cooking roasts. You can put them up against the wall and you've got a portable oven. Um, that's a ha electric house in the wintertime, right? The more airtight and, and insulated you can make it, 
the less heat you got to throw into the thing. You know, and the leakier that box is, the more you're going to be chasing your tail trying to trying to manage it. So, um, but again, air is hard to see, and and it's tough to make a house out of thousands of pieces airtight. All right, it's interesting. Yeah, air is hard to see. Right, even when you look at a car, uh, people don't really care about the aerodynamics of the car. They just want to know how many how the gas mileage is, and even then, they don't care. They just want to know if they can like get up and go on the highway, <laughs> and they're willing to. You pay. Know, or you drive a car and it's really loud because the door seals are bad, right? Why is it loud? Because of air leakage. Because that's that's your road noise. How do you know the car windows unrolled a little bit? Because it or you know because it's loud. You turn it that extra quarter inch, it seals up. The car gets quieter. Same thing with a house. You know, I want to get rid of street noise. Air seal. Right. Interesting. Air seal. Um, okay. Let's. I wanted to cover. I wanted to talk about the blower door setup. Maybe you can go over that a little bit, and then maybe cover a little JLC, and then we'll just wrap it up. Cool. Uh, so, uh, blower door, the the red door of truth. <laughs> this is the, my favorite. It's so funny. So, uh, my understanding is you pressurize or vacuum. You go. Okay. You look, I'm going to let you handle this, but basically you. You're, you're going to test the, the air exchange in the house, right? So, yeah, the, the, I mean, the fan is, is pulling air out of the house. And the reason we depressurize is, um, you know, well, there's a couple of reasons, but primarily you're going to be pulling closed all your exhaust dampers. So your bath fans, your dryer vents, all those things get, get sucked closed when you put the house under negative pressure typically. Oh, okay. so. So now you're only measuring leaks through unintended openings, right? Um, and when you're doing a blower door test in the winter time, the house doesn't get as cold as fast when you're depressurizing. Uh, when you have to pressurize the house, you're taking outside air and just rifling it down the front hallway of the home um, and it'll chill a house real quick. And you're blowing all the vents open, right? So um, there, there are circumstances where you, where you might pressurize to keep, you know, uh, where you don't want to be pulling, say, vermiculite or asbestos from the wall cavities into the home. So you pressurize in those cases. Um, there's mold issues you might pressurize. But for the most part, we are depressurizing the house. Um, and with all, you know, I, I tell, you know, my students that we're closing up, we're sealing up the box. You know, outside windows and doors, doors are closed and latched. Inside is everything on the inside is open and all your mechanical systems are shut down. No combustion, no, no ventilation. Um, the fan pulls air out down to a, a test pressure. Um, and when we hit that test pressure, we go, okay, how many CFM did we need to, to get down to our test pressure? Um, you know, if you had a two liter pop bottle and you were sucking the last couple drops out of it, you could probably, you know, suck on that bottle and collapse that pop, you know, that two liter bottle, right? If you popped a hole in it, you know, with a pen, you could still probably suck on it and collapse the bottle, but it, you'd have to pull a lot more air, right? And if I if I pop five or six holes in that pop bottle, mm, you might not be able to, to with, with your own lung pressure, you know, collapse the bottle. So the more holes there is, the more air you'd have to pull to, to get an equivalent pressure, right? So that's the idea. And then now the fan is calibrated so I can actually measure, you know, the air flow across the fan. So, and I know that with a rigid box, which is the house, if I pull a thousand CFM out somewhere, a thousand CFM came into that box because the box volume doesn't change. If I had a plastic bag or a balloon, well, I'd expand or I'd collapse, but the house is rigid. So I have a rigid volume. The air is incompressible at those pressures. So if a thousand CFM go out, a thousand CFM are coming in. So we're, we're doing kind of an indirect measurement of, of air leakage through the building enclosure by figuring out what goes out the fan. Um, and if a house is super tight, you know, maybe the fans only moving 300 CFM and boom, you're right down at pressure and it's, it's a tight house. Um, you know, if you've got the fan wide open and turned all the way up, that's probably like a, you know, old Victorian balloon frame house with no insulation in the walls. That's just a big, you know, you know, chimney of a box, man. It's just air is just whip, you know, ripping through that thing. Um, tight new homes or, or. Um, you know, condo units, you know, you might be using 
a fan that we use for duct testing on the entire unit because that's how tight they are. Passive houses, yeah, you don't have to come out with a blower door. You can come out with your little duct blower fan and, and depressurize the house with that. So that's when you know you're baller, right? When, you're, when, you're when your houses are being tested with duct fans, you know, you're a, you're, you're a baller of a builder right there, man. Um, and, uh, and some, and some builders can do it. Um, so that's, I mean, that's the, the blower door test. And we, we do. Is this, the, is this the baller one right here? Yeah. Yeah. With that little fan. Um, so, uh, and, and so you have a CFM leakage, right? But we normalize it for volume, right? So a big house, yeah, you know, justifiably would leak more than a small house, you know, should leak, right? I shouldn't be pulling 3000 CFM out of a small house, but out of a, you know, a house under a thousand square feet. But if I have a 6,000 square foot house, you know, a thousand CFM is pretty tight, right? So we normalize it for volume. So there's your, there's where you get your air changes per hour, right? And so in Illinois right now with the blower door going on a house, you shouldn't change the air more than four times. So you'd have four air changes with the fan going. Um, and we've tested houses at 12, you know, air changes at 50, 20 air changes at 50. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. We had, we had one house when we did a conversion, we figured out every bit of air in that house is leaking out every half hour. They had two air changes an hour naturally, right? I mean, it's, yeah, that a house like that's like a, a charcoal starter. You know, it's just a can with with air coming in the bottom and heat going out the top. It was it was ridiculous. Is that like um, this one is for the bad house or the big house? That's for the big house. Yeah, that's for, you know, um, multi-unit homes. You know, you're testing like a 12 unit apartment building or something like that. And they have a common egress. Um, yeah, that'd be that'd be for big building testing. Got it. This yeah. Big dog. Right um, so it's it's a it's a great tool um, to quantify, and then we do we can do pressure readings around the home to figure out you know where leakage, what rooms might be leaking, and that kind of thing. Our joining attic zone, how leaky is the attic to the house? How leaky is the garage to the house? Um, you know those attached areas shouldn't have any airflow. I mean, who goes to the garage for a breath of fresh air, right? So why do you want that air infiltrating your house? You know you get all the all the chemicals and car, you know, fumes, you know, every, all the filth that you keep out in your garage, you want that stuff, you know, leaking in your house. Well, that can often happen. Um, so we want to, we want to make sure that certain areas are, are airtight and other areas, you know, um, you know, everything can flow inside the house, but I don't want air from the house going to the attic or air from the garage coming to the house. Um, and then the infrared camera is uh, a great tool to use with the blower door. When the blow door is running, everything is leaking in. Every leak in that house is coming in through the holes and out through the fan. So you can basically map the pattern of holes throughout the house. Now I know in the winter time, holes at the top of the house are gonna be leaking out and holes at the bottom are gonna be leaking in. And in the summertime, that's gonna shift. And then windy days, it'll leak in on the left side and leak out on the right side until the wind shifts and then it goes out the other way. So the direction you know, that the air leaks through a particular hole can change with conditions. I don't care. I just want to know where the holes are because once we know where the holes are, then we can put together a plan about what holes are most, you know, are most important to get sealed up, you know, to, to improve the, you know, the cold rooms or the hot rooms or the moisture issues and mold growing or, or whatever the case might be. So blower door with, with, with infrared camera and doing some supplemental pressure diet, you know, uh, we refer to a zone pressure diagnostics, you know, so measuring the pressure of different zones to get a better idea of how air is moving through uh, that assembly. So it's, uh, it's cool, man. It, it you know, it, it was like somebody giving me a pair of glasses after being nearsighted all my life. You know, you're looking wow. at buildings, it's all kind of fuzzy. You got a rough idea what it is. And somebody's like, hey, put these on. You're like, oh, holy cow, everything's got crisp edges, you know? It's, it was, it was, a, it was a game changer. Um, and, um, so like I said, I'd like to think if I was still doing remodeling projects, I'd, I'd be doing this stuff to double check my work because, um, it helps you find, it helps you get to the heart of, of many, many issues. Now, also I should just add in here that you also do training on this, right? Is this something yep. you do? 
Yep. So that's a duct, you know, training on the duct blower right there. Um, so there's a, a certification called duct and envelope tightness verifier. So the duct system, the building envelope, tightness verification for code compliance. Um, it's a, it's a one day class. Um, you are, I would say you can become competent in a day. You will be, be, be proficient in a day, but it's, uh, it's a, it's a good class. Um, to give, we have a lot of contractors that, that go to the class just so they can understand the test that will be done on their stuff. Right. I mean, they might not test their own stuff, but they want to know what that test is like so that they know how to, you know, better know how to pass it, you know, to make sure that they're building their systems in an acceptable, uh, to an acceptable level. Uh, what are you doing here in this photo? So that's a multi-unit project. Um, we're measuring airflow on the ventilation system. So they have um, a, a vent termination. Um, it sucks in fresh air on the bottom and exhausts stale air at the top. I had to actually feel the, I had to fabricate a, an adapter to isolate just the exhaust and then another one to isolate just the intake so we could actually measure it because those ventilation systems are supposed to be balanced. You know, one, one unit of air in, one unit of air out. Um, if they're out of balance, uh, you don't get your appropriate heat and humidity exchange. Um, and, then, and then they have to be adjusted for to run the appropriate amount of time. You know, a small unit doesn't need that thing turning, you know, you know, 60 minutes out of the hour. Sometimes it may run, you know, fractionally at 15 minutes of every hour because that's all that little unit needs. Um, other units might need, you know, 45 minutes out of every hour. So um, in, unless you measure it, you don't know. You're just guessing. You're just slapping boxes together and, and BSing people that it's, everything's working right. And uh, this is your website right here where you, uh, you have all these things. You got the, the training and uh, this is great. Yep. Yeah, uh, I like to tell people, like, if you know anybody's got questions about a house, whether they're buying it, selling it, building it new or trying to make sense of what they got, we can we can help them out. OK, Matt's got his hand up. Go for it, Matt. All right, we'll see if this works on my phone. Uh, Joe, that's awesome. You do that class, man. I'll have to come up. I'll have to try to come up and do that. Yeah, we'd but, like to. Yeah. Have you. yeah, that'd be fun. We'll, we'll get we'll get Mark to show up and <laughs> hang out and. We'll make Absolutely. it fun, but yeah, that's awesome. Also, the, I had somebody, it was on LinkedIn, they they told me, I made, is it the, is it BPI? Yep. So I had somebody tell me that I may enjoy getting into that or digging deeper into that, like, because that, that's, that's a certification, right? Is that correct? Yeah. So BPI is the Building Performance Institute, um, and um, that was the first certification I got. It focused more around taking existing homes, evaluating them, um, and improving them in a safe and effective manner. Um, turns out when you make a house tighter, you can turn some things sideways. I mean, you can have some very, very negative combustion safety uh, um, issues from simply tightening up a house without paying attention to that stuff. Um, I mean, we, we, I went in a house that had 22 gas leaks. Nobody knew there was 22 gas leaks because it was all drifting up the, the chimney chase and leaking out the attic. What if somebody came in? To, oh, we're just going to air seal the attic. We're not going to mess with the heating system. We're not going to we're just going to seal up the attic. Yeah, you're just going to seal up the drafty hole that happens to be, you know, keeping these people from getting sick and keeping the house from filling up with gas. Right. So anytime you start tweaking a system, you kind of have to do it with big eyes, man. You have to look at what else could I be affecting? Because the homeowner has to, you know, has to live in there. And if I jack something up, I'm going to hurt people, or at least there's a potential to. So I have a responsibility to look at some of those, you know, ramif you know possible ramifications. And I have, to, I have to incorporate that into my evaluation. So, you know, when people hire us, oh, I just have icicles, or I, I just need this. I'm like, we're doing a whole home evaluation. We're doing combustion safety on your house. Well, I don't need that. You know, with all due respect, you don't know enough to tell me what you need or not. Right. And, you know, you don't, when, the, when, the, when you go to the doctor with a shoulder pain and, and, and doctor will say, great, I'm going to, I'm going to listen to your heart. You slap the stethoscope out of the guy's hand and go, doc, it's not the heart. It's the shoulder. Get that thing away from me. 
I'll tell you what test you're going to do. Like, no, you don't slap the doctor's hand away. You don't tell the building performance guy what tests you need done on your house. The fact you're calling me tells me you don't know what you need. You know, you don't have enough knowledge, you know, to make that determination. I don't have enough knowledge to do my own, you know, will and, you know, and trust documentation. I don't know how to do my own real estate closings. You know, I, I, I go to professionals who know about things that I, that I know little of. And when people call us, it's likely because they need somebody knowledgeable to, to help them make sense of what they got or to call BS on a contractor or just to get them on track. Right. And so, you know, BPI did a, did a great job putting together their their, their um, uh, certification course to to evaluate an existing home safely and effectively. Um, and now they're kind of shifting, or they they've since shifted to include more quantified analysis of homes. ResNet um, was more focused, typically on new construction, although there's some existing construction energy efficient mortgage programs that were there but it was more quantification. Um, so it lended itself more to the new construction uh, product where you've got, I know every wall assembly, floor assembly, I know window specs, I, I've got all that detail and I can do that, that detailed, you know, quantified um, analysis on the house to figure out energy usage. Um, and, and, and they're both looking at the, at the same stuff. One is, one is trying to take, an existing home and bump it up. Another one is trying to put together, you know, an efficient house from scratch. Um, they're still dealing with the same building dynamics. And, and, um, and, and so being a ResNet HERS rater, um, typically working more using that certification when dealing with new construction, energy star homes and such. Um, there is a lot more overlap than that. I made it very generalized. People are going to be yelling at me because they're going to say, well, ResNet, do you like, yeah, I know we're, we're doing broad strokes here, folks. So if you're mostly focused on, you know, you, you know, evaluating existing homes and, and trying to improve them, BPI is the way to go. If you're dealing mostly with new construction, go ResNet. And if you can get them both, you know, I, I, I can advise people so much better about new homes because of the existing home issues that we have to go and figure out. You know, so I can tell you like, hey, you can build it like that, but you're going to have this problem or that problem if you use this material or that material. Why? Because I see it on dozens of old houses, you know. So, you know, I'm just saying, <laughs> do it. you're going to do what you want to do. But you ask me my opinion and I'm telling you what I've seen. I, t I You know, here's what works. Here's what doesn't. I'm not going to buck reality, you know. Um, I'm going to copy what successful people do and I'm going to avoid what unsuccessful people do. I like it. Joe, you get the New Jersey seal of approval. You got the <laughs> attitude. It's <Excellent>. great. <laughs> uh, this is awesome. Joe, you seem like you're in the right spot. You're very passionate and you're diligent and you're into it. It's cool, man. I appreciate you bringing us through that whole thing. The only thing left I got is just give me a preview of JLC. I've never been there. What do you, what should I look for as a, as a shop teacher? I don't, I really don't do the home stuff, but I'm, I'm learning about, and I, and I really like the energy stuff. So, so where should I go? What should I do? Well, one, uh, I would say check out um, online. They're going to have, you know, who's speaking and when. So, you know, kind of get an idea of, of the different classes and courses that they may do. And I don't know if you've got the full, you know, there's the expo, which is basically a big trade show. So you have manufacturers and product, you know, software folks and everybody that's got a product for, you know, people in the construction industry, they're going to have a booth there. Um, so that's pretty cool. It's like going to a big flea market or big, you know, conference trade show. Um, but the education sessions, I, I think, are generally awesome. Um, I, you're, you're always going to be pulling some gold nugget out of anything that anybody says out there. Um, even after doing this for over a decade, um, you know, I go to these, you know, to specifically look for those little, little nuggets of, of information that I've not experienced or seen or heard yet. Um, and, uh, so, you know, I, if you go to just the expo, that's, that's fine. You'll, you'll meet a lot of great people and you'll learn a lot of new stuff about products and, 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 you know, that are, and techniques that are getting incorporated into the market. 
into residential construction, but um, the education sessions, I think, are a boon. Um, so who's the keynote speaker? Who's, you know, do you, do you recognize anybody? I mean, you know, sometimes you get a chance to see, you know, somebody that you've seen on HGTV or whatever, Bob Vila show, you know, there might be those guys speaking. Um, but other than like, look at, you know, look at the different courses. There may be something that just kind of jumps out at you, um, whether it's like, you know, um, permaculture where you're, you know, you're, you're, you know, you know, if you're, you've got a gardening bent, um, maybe it's energy efficiency, maybe it's solar, maybe it's air quality. Um, yeah, I mean, they've got just a ton of different classes. I mean, most of the time it's, it's, it's a plethora of stuff that I, you know, I'm like, man, there's like three different things all going on at the same time that I want to see, <laughs> you know? So in a case like that, I'm like, oh, they're recording that one. So I'll watch it later. Uh, I'm going to go to the one that they're not recording, you know, cause I, that'll be my only chance to see it. Um, yeah. So I think you go through that list. I'm, you know, I got to think that if you're, if you're a curious mind, you're going to have plenty of choices, uh, as far as, you know, topics that'll intrigue you. Um, you know, I like learning stuff. Um, I like knowing more things because the more stuff I know, the more I can, more things I can, uh, you know, bring together. I can find analogies to other dynamics and, um, you know, you learn something in one field and you go, hey, that's analog analogous to this other thing that we're seeing over here. So the more you know, the more you can figure out. Um, so go to learn and, and make sure you make sure you bring your glad hands, man. You know, just say hi, introduce yourself and, you know, start networking. There's going to be, you know, a ton of opportunities for that. That's awesome. That's great. All right. So <laughs> we'll wrap it up here. I actually still got a pack because I'm leaving straight to school tomorrow. And we're headed up there. I'm bringing a, he's a science teacher, but he's kind of a shop teacher. Um, Joe, this has been awesome. Uh, I really so one more question. It. Hold on. One more question. Yeah, please. So, yeah. What, um. Have you uh, done anything with drone inspections, using drones for home inspections, roof? Um, I've, I've, we've not we've not incorporated that into our business. Um, I've, I've got a drone. I've played around with it. There's there were some legalities. There were some, mm, you know, certain market forces that, you know, were where there, there were at some point there was a there was this presumption that, you know, oh, yeah, you're just going to do a drone inspection for free. What do you mean you're going to charge extra for it? I'm like, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars of equipment plus the you know the insurance and everything else that's involved and you want me to just bake that in you know and you know it was it was there like i said there's a lot of things that went into that um we are within the with it by before the end of this year we'll have a drone we'll have a drone that we'll be using um it's it's inevitable you find houses that um you can't walk the roof you know cedar shake roof you know uh, steep pitch roofs um you know, camera poles can get you a long way, you know, just basically it's camera on a stick, um, you know, puts, puts eyes where, you know, where you can't reach, um, you know, so, you know, we're always bringing, you know, kind of building out the, uh, the equipment set. Uh, a colleague of mine has a camera on a little remote control tank that he uses in crawl spaces because he's, he's 300 some pounds and six foot seven, and he's not crawling in a crawl space for nothing. You know, he can't get through some attic hatches, but he's got his little remote control, you know, uh, cameras that he can plop in an attic that'll crawl over Joyce. So it'll go into a crawl space. I'm like, hey, man, you know, somebody better put eyes in that attic. If you're paying that home inspector, whether he's up there or he's putting remote control eyes up there, somebody better be you know, looking at the place for you. So um, it's it's usually folks like that that we're incorporating. I'm still, you know, skinny and, and flexible. So I'll climb on top of stuff and, and get right on it. So I've been able to push off the drone stuff, but you know, it, it's becoming more and more and more necessary and it's becoming more, um, e it's becoming easier to incorporate because I think there's uh, one company that created a drone that weighs like one gram less than the federal limit. So you don't have to register it the same way. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's, it's like flying a little mosquito around the thing with a 4k camera strapped to it. So there's, there's a lot of neat stuff out there. Yeah, as, as teachers, we're uh, like incorporated in the school. I know Nick has one. I have one. I have run an after school program. So it's always like getting the real world connection with them. Um, I still get email notifications for like, uh, you know, drone surveyor or drone drone home inspectors. So I was just wondering what uh, how you were with the technology. Up, keep it up. There's 
you know, with home inspections, there's so many different subspecialties. Um, I mean, you could do, you know, insect, you know, pest inspections, you could be doing radon, you could be doing um, mold investigation, drone inspections, infrared, you know, inspections. I mean, so there's, um, I mean, most home inspectors have kind of a subspecialty. Um, some have many. Um, I think it's, it's good to not have too many of them because, you know, you can't be great at all of them, right? You know, so you kind of have your core set of skills and then there's the things that you like doing. And then at that point, it's a matter of, I, at least the way we go about it, we network with other, you know, I'll bring in other inspectors on jobs if they've got a subspecialty and it'll complement, you know, or, you know, what we're doing, um, you know, we'll bring other guys in. It's, it, you know, if you had all these certifications, you'd spend, you know, two months of your year just going to classes just to try to keep up your kitchen education and certifications and licensing, you know, so, it, you know, at some point it's hard to justify all the, all the subspecialties, but drones, drones will work their way in there pretty soon. Cool. Yeah. And then uh, I guess, does Matterport have anything to do with inspection? I wonder, maybe that's just documentation. Matt, yeah. Matterport will, will basically create a 3d rendering 3d model of your house, a digital twin, right? Uh, camera, infrared, li I don't know, infrared LIDAR. So it's um, light emitting infrared. So it can actually get measurements. Um, and that's what you see on some of the 3D real estate or uh, real estate listings where you can kind of do like a 3D tour of the house. Most of those were done with a, some type of mad report uh, imaging where they, they took pictures from various locations, stitched them all together. And effectively you got a little digital, you know, copy of the house. So it's, uh, it's pretty slick. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, Matt was doing some of it on the last house and maybe he'll do some on, this house coming up. <laughs> cool. This is great. Uh, it seems like it's a really big topic. And Joe, I appreciate you breaking it down for us. I know we just kind of, like you said, broad strokes. I'm sure there's a lot to, there's a lot to this. I mean, it's the whole house, you know, wow. a, lot, a lot of different sub subsystems and aspects of the business. That's for sure. It's like, it's like, it's like, imagine if you're buying a used car, but the used car could be a hundred years old. And then you're wondering about the engine. It's like, oh, you got a good engine? Yeah. Well, there's more than just, yeah, there's what kind of engine and how many horsepower does it have? And is it efficient? You know, it's like, can you upgrade? Is it worth it? Man, it's so funny because cars only last about 15 years and then people just throw them out. So, um, you know, unless it's like classic or something. Uh, but so houses, they're, they're on the road for a lot longer and they, you spend a lot more time in them. So it's pretty amazing the effort that goes into the houses. So I think, yeah, you need, to, you need to have an inspector that is on the case, you know, it's cool. Always, always good to have somebody, uh, somebody to, to, to tap with, with deeper knowledge in, in, in an area that you're not expert at. Right. Um, so it's, you know, we, we find those things that we're good at and, and, you know, and, you know, I've gotten good at figuring out houses, you know, and so um, I'll leverage that skill while, you know, other people will leverage their auto repair skills for me or their, <laughs> you know, shoot home repair stuff. I mean, I've been, you know, busy helping people with their houses. I don't have time to do some of my own home maintenance. So, um, yeah, it's uh, but, you know, you do stuff in trade and you help people out. And, hey, you do that. And I'll do this. And it's, it's nice when everybody can kind of play to their strengths and, uh, you know, you kind of create that, you know, interconnected network of folks um, where everybody's kind of helping everybody else out and, you know, kind of lifting up the overall average. So um, that's, at least that's the way I like look at it. Nice. I appreciate your time. Uh, hopefully we'll be in touch in the future. Be so yeah. cool if uh, Matt and you and Mark get together and do something that would be really cool. Keep us in the loop, and uh, I will post this on the uh, on our YouTube channel. But also, the audio will be on Spotify uh, not not long after, maybe a week or two awesome. after. We're just trying to catch up. Uh, appreciate it. Anybody got any last questions? Pretty good. All right, so we're gonna kill it here. Thank you so much. And, Thank you, uh, Yeah. 
I appreciate you guys having me out. I enjoyed myself and I uh, look forward to joining you again. All right. And, uh, and, and thank you guys for your service because, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of kids out there that, um, that need to know that, you know, working with your hands, um, building things, creating things, fixing things, um, that is how you build self-esteem is, is actually completing something, building something, creating something. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and having, you know, that, that physical feedback of, of something in real life that you're doing. Um, I think that's, there, there's some portion of, of society that that's, that's what's going to give them meaning in their life um, is to find something that they can, you know, at the end of the day, go, I built that, I did that, I fixed that. I set those tiles. I, I, you know, I fixed that car. Um, I fabricated that, you know, that contraption, you know, um, you know, so I'm, I'm glad that you guys, uh, are, are keeping shop class going and, uh, um, I'm there to support you. Hey, I Thanks. appreciate it. Yeah. We're, we're trying to, we're trying to make 3d three dimensional language cool again, you know, like 3d using your actual hands, you know, <laughs> instead of two dimensional, uh, you know, it's kind of, they made two dimensions, the requirement they, they tried to make life 2d in the schools and it's like, well, that's not real. You know, 3d is kind of where, where we live. So luckily, awesome. so, uh, thank you for the support. All right. I'll kill Great the recording guys. here and, uh, we are done.